Um, to begin with, uh, I would draw your attention to the standard safe harbor um, statement. I am going to be making some forward-looking statements during the course of the presentation today. So just to begin with a high-level overview, we're very proud to be recognized as a long-standing leader in the field of uh, regenerative medicine. That's something we've been involved in for quite some time. Uh, personally, I'm very excited to see the number of people here, the number of companies presenting this week, and the incredible progress that's really happening across the field. I think that's something that, to be celebrated, and, and we're very excited about that. Um, our focus as a company is really on the critical care spectrum, um, as I'm going to be talking about today. We intentionally have elected to focus on areas where there is substantial unmet medical need, uh, and in particular areas where current standard of care does not effectively address the needs of the patient or the needs of their families, and resulting in a very high cost and high quality of life burden for, uh, for many individuals. Our most advanced program, which is going to be the bulk of my, uh, my focus today, is in treating ischemic stroke patients. These are patients that have suffered substantial disabling um, stroke events and that have not been helped by current standard of care or did not have a temporary stroke or, or were not able to compensate for the, uh, for the debilitating and the damaging events that took place. Um, and we're excited about the fact that we've received multiple regulatory designations around this program, which is um, now in a phase three trial that I'll talk about a little bit later, including fast track designation, RMAT designation, and uh, a SPA or special protocol assessment from the FDA, as well as other designations that we've received. We're also very excited about our ongoing partnership with Helios, which we just recently expanded, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation as well. Uh, they are currently also conducting a pivotal study in Japan called the Treasure Trial. Um, behind that, we have a very robust set of other programs, and I'm going to talk about some of the clinical and, and other programs that we're most excited about. We also have a very solid balance sheet. At the, as of the end of the second quarter, we finished with about $61 million uh, pro forma on the balance sheet, and, uh, and I would invite you to our website for, for more information on that. Um, our focus is really on developing best-in-class therapies in areas where conventional therapy or conventional medical approaches have not had much of an impact or have really failed to address the fundamental needs of the patients. We're a bit agnostic about the therapeutic areas in, in terms of things that basically are our logic and our philosophy has always been follow the evidence. The evidence tells us that our therapy can have a significant impact. Uh, we followed that in indications in the neurological, cardiovascular, inflammatory, and immune, and, uh, and other indications in the critical care spectrum. And obviously, I'm not going to have, in the span of 15 minutes, the ability to talk about all of these things today. So I'm really only going to focus on a couple of select examples in that. But, but really, it's about putting the patient first and, and believing and, and pursuing things where we feel we can really advance the standard of care. Our development efforts revolve around a platform we refer to as multi-step. This is an off-the-shelf allogeneic cell therapy approach that we've been working on now for a number of years. It's based on proprietary technology. We have well over 200 issued patents on our technology platform that relates to or covers composition of matter, methods of use, methods of production, and a number of other different dimensions that relates to the technology. This technology is distinctive because not only is it highly scalable, a point I'll come back to in just a minute in terms of, in, in terms of uh, the, the product platform overall, but we can administer it without tissue matching or immune suppression of any kind, and we've demonstrated that, that across multiple different clinical programs. We know a lot about how the product works. It conveys therapeutic benefits through multiple distinct mechanisms. I'm going to touch on some of those today. Uh, and that makes it different from traditional therapies, whether it be protein, uh, peptide, traditional pharmaceutical type therapies. Cells are, in these cells in particular, are dynamic living entities that can actually convey benefits in multiple ways. We've demonstrated that we can administer the product very efficiently, either systemically using a simple IV administration or locally, uh, which we use in certain situations. And we've also demonstrated that we have a very long shelf life on this product. We can store it in frozen form, and we've got stability data that extends out beyond seven years. And we have also demonstrated and published on the fact that we can actually generate millions of, of doses from banks that are created from a single healthy consenting donor, and we can do this very consistently across uh, multiple donors. One of the things that we've worked very hard on over the past few years Ultimately, the therapies that we believe are going to have the greatest impact in the field of cell therapy and regenerative medicine are the ones that are not only meet the criteria of being scalable, but also can be administered or delivered to patients in an efficient and straightforward manner. That's how you get adoption at the clinical sites by the doctors that are actually going to be administering these therapies. So we've worked very hard on this particular point over the past few years. And in fact, um, 
uh, this slide is just meant to summarize how simple it is to actually prepare and then ultimately administer our product. Basically, the preparation consists of three very simple steps. Step one is you remove the vial from the freezer. Step two is you thaw the frozen suspension of cells into liquid form. Step three is you transfer that liquid form uh, cell suspension from the vial into an IV bag of essentially saline. That's it. From that point, you can take it to the patient, and it's a very simple and straightforward IV administration. And again, we spent a, I'm kind of trivializing just how much work had to go into developing this, but it's something that we've worked on for a long time and are very proud of the fact that we've developed something that can be prepped and administered essentially in any part of the hospital. It doesn't require a hood, doesn't require any specialized facilities. Either a nurse or a pharmacy tech can actually do this uh, with, nominal, uh, with nominal training, essentially. Another thing that we've worked very hard on is improving the scalability of the manufacturing of our technology. Um, like most companies that start off working in this space, we started off with more or less traditional two-dimensional cell culture manufacturing platforms, but then over time we've transitioned into bioreactor. Uh, by the time we achieve our goals in terms of where we intend to be from a commercial perspective, we will be in large-scale bioreactors. This will give us the capacity to meet the demands for some of the big indication areas that we're going after for things like ischemic stroke or some of the indications that we're going after. Uh, we're also partnered with a number of different outside independent uh, leading contract manufacturing organizations, uh, including in the U.S., in Europe, and in Japan. As I mentioned, we've done a lot of work to understand how our technology might be beneficial, uh, working with outside independent investigators across a variety of different areas. Uh, we know a lot about what these cells do. They actually home to sites of tissue damage, inflammation, and injury, where they can promote healing and tissue repair through a variety of different mechanisms. We also know that they migrate to specific organ systems that are central to the healing and repair process, and I'm going to come back to that point in just a minute. I'm not going to have the opportunity to go into depth on, on most of this today, but I would certainly invite you to our website uh, where we have dozens of publications that illustrate the work that we've done with outside independent uh, key opinion leaders and, and labs. As I mentioned, our most advanced program, which is now in phase three, both in, in this, uh, the, uh, the study that I'm going to describe as well as in a registrational trial in Japan, is in treating patients that have suffered debilitating strokes. Um, I think most people are generally aware that stroke is a big problem globally, but, I'm, but there are many people that are not aware of just how big of a problem it is. Stroke is the leading cause of serious disability in the world today, and it's a leading cause of mortality in many countries around the world. On a global basis, there are about 17 million people every year that suffer the debilitating effects of a stroke. And this is a problem because current standard of care is not available to most of these patients or has minimal impact. Um, <coughs> the, the two examples of that are TPA or surgical approaches, thrombectomy, which can be used to physically uh, or, or chemically alleviate the, the blockage that actually causes the stroke. But the sad truth of it is, is that the vast majority of patients that have an ischemic stroke do not get these types of interventions. And even among those patients that do get these types of interventions, only a minority of patients actually see meaningful benefit from that. So that leaves a pretty substantial unmet medical need among many, many patients that are not well served by the current limitations of standard of care. This problem is going to get bigger over time because we all, I think most people here would recognize that the world's experiencing an unprecedented demographic transition right now where we're seeing a massive increase in the aging segment of the population, not just here in the United States, but all over the world. It's a big problem and that happens to be the segment of the population that is most at risk for things like ischemic stroke. So there's a big need and we think that this need is going to continue to grow over time. Uh, this just puts in visual terms what we're talking about doing. We have clinical data, which I'll show you in just a minute which illustrates that we can effectively treat stroke patients up to 36 hours after they've had a stroke. We think that this could fundamentally change stroke care as we know it. Um, and again, we think that there's two points that I want to make here. One is, is that this is a much more meaningful treatment window, but also we can layer right on top of current standard of care. So for those patients that uh, were not benefited from intervention with TPA or thrombectomy, um, we believe, and the clinical data certainly suggests, that we can help those patients as well. So um, as well as the patients that were not uh, able to get to the hospital in time to get treated with any currently available form of therapy. So we think that we can uh, address a significant percentage of the patients that have these types of ischemic stroke events. We've also developed a very deep understanding of exactly how the therapy works. And one of the ways that the therapy works is because our brain is actually connected to another very important organ in our body, the spleen. The spleen, um, for many years, I think, was when I was at Stanford Medical School, we didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the spleen. You really only worried about it if it was ruptured or if it was lacerated or if you thought it might have to be surgically removed. 
But we've come to learn in recent years that the spleen is actually a critically important immune uh, hub. And in fact, uh, the significant majority of immune cells reside in the spleen waiting for a signal that we hope never gets sent. But if we have a stroke or other events that can occur that trigger this, this linkage between our central nervous system and the spleen, we see that what ends up happening is, is that over the couple of days that follow that initial event, we see a massive hyperinflammatory response that begins to build and, un and ultimately unleashes um, a wave of inflammation that leaves the peripheral immune system, specifically the spleen, but also other parts, and heads up to the brain and creates a lot of damage. And um, you don't have to take my word for it. You can actually look at the growing body of independent evidence that shows this to be the case. And I think in particular, this slide captures a lot of it because what you see here is on the left-hand side what normal brain tissue looks like. Uh, on the middle screen, you see what happens in the normal aftermath of a, a middle cerebral artery occlusion or a very significant stroke. And then on the right-hand side, this is a third group of animals where the spleens were surgically removed uh, prior to the surgical induction of an MCAO or middle cerebral artery occlusion or significant stroke. So what you see here on the right-hand side is that's the damage in the brain that occurs as a result of the initial ischemic event. What you see in that middle panel is, the, is the, the damage that occurs as a result of not only the ischemic event, but the inflammatory tidal wave that happens in the aftermath of that. So that really drives a lot of that damage uh, that, that ultimately is what prevents the patient from ever having really much hope of being able to recover. So we ran a double-blind phase two uh, international study called the Masters One study um, that was conducted at 33 leading stroke centers across the United States and in the UK. Again, double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial. And what this data showed was is that if we administered multi-stem, uh, and in particular if we administered within this 36-hour window, we saw dramatic evidence of improvement and recovery in these patients. The data that you see here actually reflects one of the, the two regulatory benchmarks that are most important to regulators around the world, which is something called excellent outcome. So excellent outcome is a proportion of patients that achieve not just good recovery or excellent recovery in one of several clinical scales that are used to assess these patients. These are patients that showed complete recovery. And what we saw was is that there was a very strong pattern of evidence that showed that when we treated these patients with multi-stem through a single intravenous administration, that we were seeing dramatic evidence of recovery that was statistically significant at one year. And in particular, when we looked at the patients that were treated within 36 hours, which is the way that we originally designed the study, um, we saw that this evidence was, in fact, very compelling and dramatic. And that is what helped garner the regulatory designations that, that I talked about earlier. This is just a slightly different way to look at this data. Uh, it shows that the longstanding clinical dogma that what you have at 90 days is basically what you're going to be left with for the rest of your life if you suffer a debilitating stroke is actually incorrect. Uh, when we treat patients with multi-stem, we saw a substantial amount of evidence that showed that these patients would continue to improve over time from that 90-day benchmark up to the one-year time frame. And again, this is part of the clinical excitement and the excitement in the stroke community and also part of the reason for the tremendous support we've received from the FDA and other regulators around the world. Uh, in terms of some of the other key findings from the Masters One study, we saw a very consistent safety profile. This is something we've seen across each of our clinical programs. Again, not going to have the opportunity to talk about that, uh, 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 the, all the other programs today. Again, we saw other very important parameters that showed that these patients were, were really regaining their quality of life in a substantial way. And, uh, and that is something is uh, obviously a central goal for us. We also saw a reduction in serious and severe life-threatening complications in these patients. And, and uh, we understand how multi-stem was able to achieve that by blunting that, that uh, inflammatory cascade from the spleen. We were able to protect and preserve immune system competence, which means the patients were less susceptible to immunodepression or other things that happened in the wake of the stroke. Um, importantly, we also saw compelling biomarker de uh, data that confirms our therapeutic hypothesis, and I think that's an important part of this. Many people want to see evidence like this in the studies they run. We actually have data that, that shows, I think, very clearly, both in cellular biomarkers and in cytokine biomarkers, that our therapeutic hypothesis was, uh, was actually being validated. Um, this is an important part of our relationship with Helios, and again, this is something we put in place back in early 2016, led to their ultimately getting uh, authorization from PMDA to run the pivotal study that they're now running, as well as Sakagake designation, and more recently led to the expansion of our partnership uh, in two parts. In the early part of this year, they became our largest shareholder, uh, making a significant equity investment in the company, and then more recently, um, by broadening the, the license and the collaboration, um, and we're now working on yet another aspect of the, of the collaboration expansion, uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, this just summarizes some of the key points that uh, lay out the parameters of the, 
the phase three study that we're running. Again, it's a very robust study. Um, again, happy to answer any questions about this offline for people that might be interested. Um, but in closing, I'd like to just point you to two other things that we're actually very excited about. Uh, the first is, is that uh, this is kind of a summary of some of the key elements of our pipeline. Um, the first thing is, is that we've recently added hemorrhagic stroke to our pipeline of priority programs. And the reason for this is that we've got very compelling evidence that shows that we can make a difference in hemorrhagic stroke. And, and so we believe that we could change the standard of medicine for stroke full stop, um, both ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. We haven't presented that data publicly, but we will in the not too distant future. The other thing that I'd like to just point to is the work that we've done and have been doing in trauma. So just several months ago, we were uh, with our collaborators down at University of Texas Houston and one of the leading trauma centers in the United States. We were awarded uh, funding to, from the Department of Defense to support a phase two clinical trial in trauma. This is another area where we believe we can fundamentally improve standard of care and improve outcomes for these types of patients. So just in closing, over the past, um, since the beginning of 2017, we've met quite a number of important objectives for the company. We're very proud of that. All the stuff we said we were gonna do last year, we've delivered on, and out beyond that, uh, we have a number of exciting initiatives underway, and uh, I invite any of you that are interested to continue to follow our progress, and, uh, and thank you very much for your support.